Cornish cassiterite. Cassiterite. Well, yeah, it's not tin, yeah. yeah. But if you say it's tin ore, if I turn it like that, if you get close, you'll be able to pick the sparkles off it. To look at tin, really, you'd have to look at copper. So I'm going to pick up a piece of copper. This is a local um, type of copper oil, copper sulphide. And you're more familiar with green copper oils, which is copper malachi. If you sail around the coast in a boat 4,000 years ago, you'd see green staining running down the rocks. And you would know there is copper here. But with tin, you don't get anything like that at all. It's just really invisible as a rock, as an ore. So my personal feeling is that you have to know what tin is, you need to know where to look for it, and you need the chemistry to recover it from the rock. Because you can't just throw this in a fire, heat it up, and expect it to turn to tin. You could bury the copper ore, well, not that one, you could bury the green copper ore in the bottom of a bonfire and it will turn to copper, which is strange because copper melts about 1100 degrees and tin melts about 200 and something. The chemistry needed to recover tin is quite complex, comparatively. So 4,000 years ago, someone sailed around the coast, they knew what they were looking for, they parked their boat on the beach, walked along picking up rocks, they were looking for the heavy, sparkly rock. So, who would that be? Could it be somebody from Brittany, where they're recovering tin? Or if you go further into the Mediterranean, you've got Turkey, Sardinia, Spain, Portugal have alluvial tin deposits. Remember, they're looking for gravel tin that's eroded out of mountains or out of veins onto the beaches. It's what they're looking for. If you look at tin in a vertical vein in the ground, the richest tin, 70%, will be at the top of the vein. You can see the vein is running up the hill. This is where this comes from. If you dig down, the deeper you go, the weaker the tin gets. So if you look at the local tin mine at Giva, they were chasing 1% two percent thousands of feet down in the ground in hellish conditions to recover two percent so if you think that's a hundred tons of rock will give you two tons of tin because this is 70 percent rich maybe even higher so out of your hundred tons if you had a hundred tons of that you'd get 70 tons of tin that's the difference between the bronze age a modern tin, and very few people grasp that. This is Cornish tin. So what we're going to do is try and break it up a bit smaller, and then what we're going to do is heat it up to 1200 degrees, then we're going to bring it up to 1200 degrees for about 25 minutes, and then let it cool right down. And then once it cools down, the, um, the tin will stay as a blob. Really? And you'll get three blobs, is the idea, yeah? So I'm going to... Just trying to break it up a little bit more. That's better. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is break it up into smaller bits so when it separates from the quartz, realistically you'd be trying to get all the quartz out of it to smelt it. Remember this is 70%. This is crystalline tin, so it's the richest tin and it wouldn't need a lot of processing, so you would have just uh, broken it up like this and try to remove the as much uh, quartz out of it because it is of no use and would only interfere with the smelting so there's hardly any tin in that but we're we're going to try and smelt the whole lot in one go so we're going to put that to there tip that out because it's all just nonsense and the next job is some fuel. So what we're going to do is we're going to heat the charcoal up to about 1200 degrees and not allow any air. 
It's going to be totally devoid of air, so it'll burn the carbon monoxide in the charcoal, which will liberate the ore out of the out of the out of the, out of the uh, cassiterite. So we're going to put that there for the second and keep those tidy, and then we're going to crush all this lot up. Like this, build up a layer, put some of that in, cover it, put another piece in and cover it. Does that make sense? We'll start with thick stuff at the bottom. That's partially to let things flow through. No, no, just so it gets rid of it. Okay. So we do one, so we put that lovely one in at the bottom. Okay. And we cover it over again. So we'll put another one, that's a beautiful one. Put one in there. We might put one in on the other side. So they're separated. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have a look inside? And we'll just stick the last scraps in and see what happens. Up and uh, get it into a nice 1200 degrees. Is that 1200 Celsius? Yeah, it's 2200. Uh, you'll speak. Wow, wow. So we're going to put that into there and then we're going to build the charcoal out once we get the fire going. Yeah, I'm just putting something to get the fire going first. Once the fire's going, if you get the bellows. Yes. If you're doing this in the cave, you can see the colours and you have an idea about temperature. I can see it whirling out of this one piece. Start drawing carbon monoxide back through the bellows and it catches fire, you do. We ought to make a pair like this. Add that one to the project list. Take the lid off. Okay. So there's the charcoal on burnt. And then just dip it out like you're tipping a sort of pepper. See what we do. He's now managed it. Right. Right. Dog soup. Dog soup? <laughs> <laughs> Can you feel any charcoal in there? Oh yes, at the bottom. 
it's more to be far. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh. So oh my it's goodness. still attached to the rock, isn't it? Yeah. So you can see the pearls of tin. That is amazing. Wow, it really did congeal and just... So what we can do is go down to the stream and maybe pan it slightly into the stream. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Oh, oh wow. here's another one. There you go. Rocks went in, metals came out. Yeah. It's magic, man. It's amazing. What this must have been like the first time someone did this. Yeah. So it's only a day. I mean, by the time they were doing it here, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. yeah so, they, they weren't prospecting here yeah. on the cliffs. Yeah. But I, I just want to put myself in the... I mean, it looks like, like sun and moon beams, you know? Just, yeah. The closest thing I can relate this to is the, sh the sheen of the sky or the water. But we only did a small amount. Yeah. I mean, you imagine if you had kilos of ore, you'd actually get it to puddle and then if you go larger, you'd get a volume that would actually flow. Yeah. So you could get it to uh, pour out of a furnace. But on a small scale, what I was trying to do is capture that rock, yeah. metal kind of essence, which you can only do this way by small quantities. Yeah. And, and the quality of ore as well is is the problem, that it's, it's just rare. And it seems to be a shame to um, just vaporize loads of minerals in the sake of a pursuit of more metal. Yeah, just for the demonstration, a small quantity is perfect. That, yeah. That's amazing. So if we go down to the stream, we can pan the bowl and get the charcoal out and you'll just end up with clean water and... Um, perfect. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the look of it attached to the rock. Yeah. So it becomes like a sort of elemental thing, doesn't it? Yeah. And you still got tiny bits uh, in the bottom of the... You still got a bit more charcoal to get out. Yeah. So what we have here is the smelted tin. And you can see that some of these have sort of a... These, these larger pearls, right? Like that. But if you zoom in really close, you can see that uh, over here, those are also little pearls of tin. And even down here in the dust, those are little round pearls of tin. Amazing. So yeah. and you can see here in this rock, so there's that large pearl embedded, and then there's a ton of tiny, tiny, tiny little droplets of tin also embedded in the rock. Wow. I wish we could make it work like this when we did iron, Joseph. <laughs> wow. Wow, it's beautiful. It really is something. So, uh, yeah, Joseph, what do you have in your hands there? I have a piece of tin. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to bite it. Sweet. Wow. Right there. That is a piece of tin that I have bitten. It's a relatively soft metal, but this is the key ingredient that makes copper into a hard edge for bronze tools. It's amazing. Okay, the copper is mined in Cornwall. Yep. This is Cornish copper. Yes, yeah, Cornish copper. Probably went somewhere like Hale, or um, there's a smelter in Devon, and it was converted into copper. Okay. It might have gone to Swansea and turned into copper, but it's got had a copper mark that was Cornish, and uh, it sailed around the coast and sank. 
completely in this storm. So it's, it comes from a rat. So the bar was lifted off a rat, uh -huh. and then a guy come to me asking to make him a bronze sword out of Cornish tin and Cornish copper. Really? Which I did. And then they let me keep the the last bit. Um, but the irony was, I was demonstrating copper smelting at my local copper mine. Uh -huh. And I said, wouldn't it be bizarre that if this copper was mined from here? From this spot? Yeah, and gone to the smelter. Just that far away, and then sunk right here. And then sunk somewhere off the coast of Cornwall, and then cut out and turned. It didn't and want to leave. It, and, and then come back to here. I said, what's the chances of that actually happening? Neil Burridge makes some of the best Bronze Age reproductions available, and if you'd like to check out his work, go to bronzeageswords.com. We're super grateful he helped us with this video.